I release this uh, uh, microphone to Christine. Oh, here it is. I'll have a short introduction and then I'll explain why we have the older presentations and the different perspectives. Uh, uh, when we were asked to talk about innovations for business e-participation, I was a bit baffled because for me e-participation was more citizen than business and I looked at some definitions. I decided that the most fitting one would be the one coined by Anne McIntosh, who is not with us here, about citizens attempting to influence the legislative or otherwise decision process of an administration. We want to have impact. We want to persuade. Businesses traditionally had their means and ways of doing just that. But I decided that we can compose this panel of speakers who could look at the business participation issue, first of all, from the business perspective. Do we really need the participation? And I'm a business person, first of all. Then I'm a humble researcher sometimes, but I'm a business person. I don't really feel all that much. I've got enough of administration doing 95% of my revenue from the administration. So, Christine will tell us whether it's worthwhile for a business to go and interact. Then we have Jaroslav Deminet, who happens to be a computer scientist, but uh, he works at the government legislative center, the place where they actually produce the most important law outside of the parliament. This is the legislative initiative of the Polish government. So he'll tell us how they look at businesses trying to tell them what law they would like to see enacted in this country. Then we have Eva Talo of the E-Governance Academy. We all look up to Estonia. For many reasons, there were strong ties between Estonia and Poland historically. Uh, I won't go into that anymore because I could say a few things too many. Uh, and they do have the hands-on experience. Uh, I looked through some uh, of the reports and I would be very interested regardless whether this is a citizen level or a business level, interaction with the government in a novel and uh, I would say spontaneous way is not exactly what public administration like best. So I would like to see what these interactions really produce and we have Eva for that. Then we have, have two technological perspectives. We wouldn't in the, today's world, we can't live with just one. We have Vincenzo Gianferrari Pini from Italy, who runs a company that does business in supporting large companies, small companies, administration bodies, in creating solutions with the use of Google Cloud and Google Cloud tools. An interesting thing. And the question is, is that helpful to create a platform, as Jeremy was saying, agile, low cost, trial and error, for services that could be classified as services supporting e-participation. And then we were supposed to have Jan Mulfeit, who is the Europe chairman of Microsoft. He happened to, to get ill, I understand. We have his slides, so that helps. And we have Michał Jaworski from Microsoft uh, Poland. For all the, the last 15 years, I know him. He's always been important there, but what he does exactly is hard for me to tell, but he seems to work. So that's the panel, and uh, I would like to ask Christine to take the mic. Thank you, Vigil. Thank you uh, for inviting me to the panel. I think I'm going to get up, otherwise I'm not going to see you all here. Yes, you have to press oh. this. Okay, thank you. Or I can do that here. Thank you, and thanks, uh, Wojciech, for the organization. It's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you today. And uh, frankly, to admit, uh, we told when you asked me you know, to join for the panel, I was asking the question, um, what exactly are you expecting me to talk about when we talk about e-participation for businesses? And I thought, for me, this has been tightly linked to the citizens' debate, e-participation per se. So I was trying to um, find some kind of way of getting round to put a bit of order even in my own head when we talk of e about e-participation uh, of businesses, trying to analyze what's going on and trying to look into different legal provisions and looking into 
uh, different terminology and different activity. Now, we all know that when it comes to top-down consultation, participation activities, with the citizens, governments have not been very successful. I came across an article in the Zeit, uh, a German newspaper in early in September, where frankly, uh, it was said that the government in Germany had spent a lot of money on e-participation projects for the citizen, but there was very little interest and actually claims that the government has failed in implementing e-participation through technology, but just wasted taxpayers' money. Now the question is, uh, what are we doing in terms of e-participation for citizens? Now, coming back to the, um, the uh, concepts and legal provisions uh, that I was looking at, uh, and also the studies that are available on e-participation, I came across um, some, uh, in particular also the definitions of, uh, of some of the European projects. And there you have different categories uh, that are relevant in terms of e-participation projects when you analyze them. It is about category of information provision, about campaigning, consultation, deliberation, discourse, mediation, community building, spatial planning, petitions, and voting, but also other aspects. So that's that applied to the business sector. Now, I thought I'm gonna Sorry, I'm gonna press. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna resort. Yes. Take this into your right hand. Okay, and I, okay, thank you. I didn't see that. Okay, wonderful. That much <laughs> makes much more. And the left, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm used to using my keyboards. I'm so focused on it. So I thought I'm going to resort to the, the treaty, to the uh, treaty uh, of the European Union, and uh, to look into what Article 11 on democratic decision making processes says. And it's interesting to see that there is a call for increased consultation and dialogue, but it doesn't talk about participation per se. And it talks about involving representative associations, representative associations, which includes the business sector. Now the key here is who are these representative associations and what criteria do we have to select them? And what kind of mechanisms do we have using technology to enable them to participate, not only in service provision, but also in policy making? Uh, in this regard, uh, it is quite interesting that we have launched a conference cycle to deal exactly with this question, European democracy, European dialogue with civil society, uh, which will be launched in Salzburg next year. And it will be looking in particular into the um, dialogue with the citizens, but also with other stakeholders, including businesses. And we have initiated a series of, conference, of workshops in Brussels that are supported by the institutions and other bodies and other stakeholders uh, that deal with these new forms of dialogue, as stipulated in Article 11 of the Lisbon Treaty. Now, when we talk about representative associations in the business sector, we all know uh, the uh, big names, if you will, uh, the formal associations like Business Europe, like Eurochambers, or the European Organization of medium -sized, small, and small and medium-sized enterprises, so SMEs. And we know that in particular, the Economic <coughs> and Social Council is supposed to bring the input from civil society organizations, including the business sectors, into the formal decision making. Um, we also know that in terms of other institutions, formal institutions of the treaty, that there is a lot of discussion going on in and projects going on in terms of consultation processes at the European Parliament level, at the Commission level, etc. So we can definitely enhance ICE, uh, the, the decision making processes and participation processes through the use of ICTs. And there's, as you have heard, and you will hear probably tomorrow and on Friday, there are more and more pilots and projects going on. Now the question is, when we have this top-down consultation and dialogue, and we have a set of defined institutions, 
Yeah? To what extent do we need another system or mechanism? Because we've heard today, this morning in our keynote speak, that technology enables participation, better lawmaking, better decision making, better services. But we need to also look into the institutional change. Now the question here is, to what extent do we use or better use the existing, the existing mechanisms that we have at the European, national, regional and local levels? Or do we want to have new ways of consulting the business sector? And do we then get, if you will, the representative picture across Europe? So I have a feeling if we're looking down into the different levels at the formal consultation and dialogue that we have at the moment in the institutional setup at the European level, we already have a lot of differences in the different uh, national cultural systems. Yeah? I'm just referring, for example, to my own country where we have a very long tradition of the social partners which are supposed to involve the businesses and other stakeholders' interest. Now, if we go to the uh, new options that we have heard and that we're discussin discussing, the bottom-up e-participation e of the business sector would mean that we're not resorting really, maybe, to the existing bodies like the European Economic and Social Committee or any other you know, associations or formal bodies, but we might, on an ad hoc basis or through new uh, technologies uh, find different ways of getting industries and in particular SMEs interest into the decision making processes. The question for me is, for the individual SME, I'm not, I, I, I come from a university but I'm, I'm working a lot with local authorities and local uh, businesses, so the first question that they will put is, what's in for me? Yeah? Number two, I cannot get involved because I don't understand what the issue is about. Yeah? And number three, I don't have the time. Yeah? On a societal level, if you will, the question is about transparency. Yeah? Who is going to be inputting into the policy making? We're back to representative associations, organizations, be it virtual or physical. Yeah? And there we need to set criteria. We know that these, the European Economic and Social Committee had set up nine criteria for this representativeness. I don't want to go into detail. I can tell you later on if you're interested. But it will be important to talk about these criteria and to enforce these criteria. We'll, we'll have to have a mechanism in place to judge uh, and to assess uh, the input and the participating organizations in that regard. And the overall question is, what is the public value added? Because it's not about one single vested interest that we're looking into. We are looking into the public value or the common good that should be the ultimate outcome. And as I said before, and I would be very interested in hearing about uh, what your opinion is on that, we will need new mechanisms, we will need new devices. Yeah? I'm thinking about uh, one example that was mentioned why you might know him, the founder of the German Flügel TV, who was the key figure in the, uh, in the discussions on Stuttgart 21, remember? Uh, the station area that should have been rebuilt and there's a big row and people got involved and a new mechanism to mediate was, was installed there and he founded a web TV that was documenting all the, pro all the discussions there. So he said, maybe we will, in the future, just have people giving a mandate, or businesses that could go for businesses, giving a mandate to somebody else who has more time, has more expertise, and would act on my behalf. But still, that could be done in a social network, that could be done via new technologies. We'll have to define the rules to get the right <coughs> output and to create the public value we want to have. Thank you very much. Now we flip to the other side of the coin. We have uh, Dr. Deminet from the Legislative Center. Uh, 
tell us why he doesn't like it at all. No, that's not true. That's a great idea to appoint a computer scientist to take care of the property of the law that is uh, published. Uh, yes. As we talk about E something, I start with uh, a definition from uh, Wikipedia, and it, ah, it's red disappeared. Mm, sorry, some part is red. Democracy is de generally defined as a form of government in which all adult citizens have an equal say, have, all adult citizens have an equal say is red, in the red decisions that affect their lives, and ideally, ideally this includes red equal and more or less direct participation, and in the proposal, development, and passage of legislation into law. It can also encompass social, economic, and cultural conditions that enable the free and equal practice of political self-determination. Now, uh, I would stress three parts of it. Decisions that affect their lives, which means legislation. Uh, all adult citizens have an equal say, and it is important that this, there is uh, this equal say, and traditionally it is expressed as elections, votings, referenda, and so on, and equal and more or less the direct participation. Now, we want to slightly change this participation to e-participation, but what we, do we want to mean that? And uh, the, as Christine said, uh, that is valid for both citizens and business or business representatives. Is the present democracy perfect? Well, anybody thinks it is perfect? Probably not, and everybody can say, I can see some way to improve it. Nobody is perfect. Can we improve the communication, citizen to administration, business to administration? Definitely, yes, we can. But should we complement the existing mechanism or should we replace them completely? I'm asking this question because there is a popular saying that, uh, yes, now we can change it dramatically. We can overthrow the existing ways of uh, building democracy, of democra uh, democracy itself. We can go into direct democracy as it was in uh, Athens and so on. Uh, you know, all computer scientists, IT professionals are extremely conservative. I am also conservative and so I say rather complement, rather improve, not to, not replace. Be very careful about what computers can bring you. I don't trust computers at all. I saw many different, many strange things they did. Yes, direct democracy or representative democracy. How the legislative process now is implemented in Poland, and I guess it's more or less the same in other countries. Some ministry uh, decides to implement some law. I am saying, but on all, I, I'm concerned with all the law that is created in the government, in the executive branch. Of course, then there is parliament. We can say nothing about, about what they do there, but at least the, uh, the, the bills that, are, that leave government and go to the parliament or the other regulations that are implemented directly by, by the government uh, are in our charge. Now the draft is sent using internet now to other ministries, to NGOs, Supreme Court, commerce, ch commerce chambers, other representative bodies. Uh, we have now already implemented, um, uh, I guess, quite good uh, tools and regulations for presenting any drafts to the public. 
they must be obligatory presented in inter internet and there were cases where the, the fact that the bill, the, the regulation was not presented in internet f properly was the reason for the uh, constitutional tribunal to declare it invalid because it was passed improperly without uh, keeping to the procedure. And everybody can uh, check what are the drafts or any uh, governmental regulations. Then the opinions, so far in a traditional way, are passed to the originator, to the ministry, which can or cannot take it into account. Now, of course, there is a way for uh, e-making also this vast part. Uh, that's something uh, my colleague from the Ministry of Economy will uh, tell about in, half an, in one or two hours. Uh, we are in a process of implementing that. And, uh, of course, there are some ideas of uh, uh, making a repository of all comments so that anybody can see what others commented and so on. And that's great, but can we go further and say, let everybody participate and maybe decide in this process? Uh, technically, of course, there's no problem. We can make now uh, tens of referenda every week, and even if some million people will participate, uh, servers will do. But uh, do we want it? It is manageable. Uh, suppose 30,000 people provi provides us with their opinions. Can we reasonably uh, check them? Of course not. And it, it will be unfair to the people say, to say, yes, anybody can write and we will take all your opinions into account. We will not. If we have a week for that, or two weeks, uh, we will be able to check maybe 100, maybe 200 opinions. So what to do with the others? We can, of course, and we do, uh, take into account opinions of some bodies, NGOs, uh, chambers, trade unions, and so on, but not an, an average citizen. Uh, but, on the other hand, there may be some great opinions. And I think that what is most interesting now, there is this idea of using the social grids or crowdsourcing for improving the law. Not by uh, letting every, anybody to uh, decide or to vote, but rather to uh, for people to test the law and making suggestions. If we, ha we can have thousands or millions of people uh, spending their time, devoting their time for uh, Wikipedia, for improving uh, v Wikipedia, if we can have millions of people uh, looking for foreign civilizations or for DNA or for other uh, scientific tasks, then maybe there will be also people willing to check from time to time uh, in some organized way the uh, drafted law. It is very important to find uh, small holes in law. And it happens. Like there is a regulation and then somebody sees, hey, it doesn't work in some case. It would be great definitely to find some uh, solution for that. Now, of course, I will pass through this. If uh, there is something against the decision, if we ask, if you, do you want to pay higher taxes, the answer will be no. If we ask, do you want to get higher benefits, the answer will be yes. What we do is that. And there is also one last thing that we have to be aware of. Uh, it is very nice to say that uh, in uh, Web 2.0 everybody participates, but look, now in, uh, the majority of uh, YouTube, for instance, uh, films are professionally made things. Uh, the same as with uh, blogs, with other portals. 
They are now overcrowded by professional lobbyists and other people just pretending they are average uh, citizens, which are not. And we have to be aware that if we, uh, if, when we uh, ask people for air participating in the decision-making process, that we also will not open the door for uh, lobbyists and uh, organized groups. So, internet may definitely further improve the decision-making process, but this process must be very carefully designed and monitored. Thank you very much. And now we find out what really happens in case of citizens, in case of a leading country like Estonia. And, well, then we see what happens then. Thank you uh, for these uh, nice words. Actually, I remember uh, in uh, 2000 we had, uh, we were in Poland, uh, there was some uh, uh, European uh, Commission led a big conference, ministerial conference also. We weren't uh, members of the European Union, but just aspirants. And, uh, and uh, then, anyhow, there was a, a, a public interest also. And Rzez Pospolita had uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, thing saying, that, okay, we will be in Estonia in terms of the uh, uh, development. But, um, okay, uh, where is this uh, wonderful thing? So let's start uh, immediately. I had a very uh, easy task. I had to not to figure out what to do with businesses, but just to talk about a little bit uh, of what has worked. Uh, in Estonia, we had uh, as a de sort of the development looks like that. First, we had in uh, uh, 2001, we started with a portal uh, called Today I Shall Decide, and that portal was... Uh, uh, was um, created in the uh, Prime Minister's office and I'll uh, speak about it uh, in a moment because it, it grew into this uh, uh, second phase which uh, we have now uh, sort of uh, uh, using, it's called Ozale, it's basically participate and it's also we have some experience on it. And in the meantime from this uh, Tom, today I shall decide portal. Uh, we uh, developed something with the uh, help of European Commission, uh, some kind of uh, gener more general portal, uh, open source, uh, uh, we, which now is implemented in quite a number of uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, well, it is successfully implemented, as I understand, in Sl uh, Slovenia, and now uh, the Greeks actually want uh, uh, to improve their uh, life with it, and uh, so we can see maybe uh, what it is, but basically, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, just uh, on the development scale, what is happening now, uh, we launched last year something else, a uh, uh, new thing uh, which was called uh, VOLIS. Uh, uh, it's basically the open council concept, uh, electronically, so, um, I mean, Everywhere, I guess, in uh, in uh, in our countries, uh, people can go and see the meeting of the parliament or the meeting of the local council if they so wish, but uh, they hardly do it. So uh, we tr thought of creating a system whereby this uh, uh, possibility would exist in uh, uh, in sort of uh, virtual world at least, uh, and it's not uh, uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, static, uh, watching uh, on screen some kind of uh, presentation in this hall of uh, where people come together, but rather it is uh, different. Uh, it is uh, m meant to be, uh, to give possibility to actually uh, also then express initiatives, take part in this and so on. So I'll uh, uh, go and talk about this a little bit. Uh, um, uh, first, uh, the TAD uh, uh, plus, or the TOM, as we called it initially, um, and uh, this, uh, um, uh, this well, one could think of it as, uh, and for businesses it would be good, because it, uh, the idea started, you know, uh, in the Soviet times, if somebody still remembers uh, from Polish audience, or this, I mean, uh, socialist times, we had this kind of uh, uh, complaint books in the businesses that uh, you could write your complaints that, okay, this uh, uh, whatever was on sale wasn't, uh, or the, the lady wasn't uh, that polite or whatever. So uh, you could 
imagine this as an electronic complaint and proposal book. And initially, it worked really well. Uh, as a concept, it was very simple. I mean, you can propose something, uh, and you don't have to worry how they solve this. Uh, the main thing you wanted to get was some result. And uh, I think uh, that was one of the big lessons. I'll come to these lessons, but basically, uh, it isn't technology. It is uh, process setups that is really important. And also, it isn't uh, the, uh, the other things that came from there. It is if you have this uh, kind of uh, processes started from the top. I mean, the top leadership is really uh, important. But now, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, something else. I mean, in this uh, TID Plus thing, we sort of uh, uh, invite its opinions and uh, somehow rank these opinions. Uh, and um, these were single opinions going to, uh, to be then uh, um, somehow accommodated, assimilated in the work of administration. Now this uh, participate EE, or I mean in Estonian it's OSALE, uh, this is uh, somehow a different concept. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, all these kind of data flows uh, that go from the ministry to the government, from the government, uh, government back to the ministry, let's say there were some changes finally to the cabinet and from the cabinet to parliament, that we open up these data flows to the citizens and also for businesses. So you can uh, come in uh, and not only come in, you can observe this uh, process uh, at any level uh, from the moment that it leaves the uh, first ministry. I mean, the initial idea is that uh, you have to give some privacy for the people who conceptualize it, but after that, uh, it is an open process. And when and if it is open process, you actually have much more chance to influence the outcome. So that uh, by itself is a very interesting project, works very well, however, uh, <clears throat> What we failed to do, maybe uh, on purpose, I don't know, I'm not uh, representing government here, uh, only about 10% of uh, uh, draft bills go through this. Uh, so uh, it, uh, for us, the task is to get uh, the rest of the 90% of the bills uh, through this system as well. And uh, then we can speak more about it. So. Um, <clears throat> If I just sort of wrap it up, uh, the technology part is really, really little. I, I'm tr I tried to, to draw an iceberg there, but it didn't really work too well, I guess. Uh, but uh, so the technology is uh, on the top, so 10%. Uh, all the rest, uh, there are lots of other things. I mean, it's uh, administrative setup, how it works. It is uh, uh, that you have to use it in multi-channel approach. I mean, if you just think that it is, uh, 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 broadcasted in uh, internet and that should be enough, uh, it doesn't work. It has to be on the newspapers at the same time, it has to be on TV and uh, sort of only then it reinforces itself and you have uh, good results. Um, you, have, uh, uh, you have to have, uh, well, one of the clear thing is feedback. I mean, uh, uh, to, you have to have the feedback mechanism. People have to understand that uh, something follows from their uh, participation. Uh, that is sort of you are creating respect to people. You have to provide uh, uh, things, uh, but uh, you have to have this integration uh, with social networks, etc. And it has to be fashionable somehow. I mean, that's the kind of funny thing. I mean, if it isn't fashionable, if it isn't on, the, then it doesn't work. So basic, uh, but the, the basic conclusion sort of uh, is rather simple. Um, it is a delicate environment. When we want to create with the people this kind of participation uh, um, <coughs> dialogue, um, it's not dialogue, I mean, when we want people to participate, uh, then we have to be very careful following these basic rules uh, uh, because uh, uh, it is very easy to break it. Uh, we've seen with uh, experience of these initial projects that we started in 2001 uh, that uh, uh, the lifespan or the in initial interest is about three years. 
I mean, uh, initially people go there, uh, it is broadcasted, it is uh, talked about, uh, debated, and everybody is very happy. And then, uh, uh, well, uh, <coughs> sort of the, the interest uh, fades away. So uh, just uh, five simple ideas, uh, start early, show genuine interest, provide clear and comprehensive materials, use different channels and platforms and give feedback, and then, well, it works. Thank you very much. Now, having a nice back, we have two technology persons. One is Vincenzo Ferrari, who is dealing with Google, mainly. He won't be mentioning Google much, I understand. Hello, everybody. Being Italian, I need to use both my hands, otherwise I can't speak. So I prefer to use it this way. So. Okay, hopefully. I will try to stay in my 10 minutes, although I normally like to speak a lot, so I will try to hurry up. So, um, as uh, Vitek said, uh, um, I work in a company that uh, is a startup, completely working in the, in the cloud arena, which is something quite new, we believed in this, and uh, we are mainly offering services around uh, the Google offering, but I'm not going to talk about Google. Google is well known. Its offering is uh, very large, a large-scale offering, the cloud computing. The things I'm going to say, I'm sure that also Microsoft uh, will share those because it's uh, common to them. Um, I will mostly, which, which is the, this one, the right hand, um, my small agenda is, I will say not, I won't talk about cloud computing, what it is. Everybody knows, almost everybody knows what it is about. But I will stress one point about it. To uh, say how I think that e-participation can benefit from cloud computing. And why? Because it's a bottom-up process that is going on. Something that's already happening. And the technology here can help. And uh, my view is that the things are coming from the bottom, not from the top. Somebody already said it. A lot of people said it already today here, this. Then, talking what can be uh, offered, smart services that can be offered using this kind of technology, smart services in the area of, the, of uh, e participation, but uh, coming from business interests, so the players are not only the citizen, but also the business, small, big and large, and also the government and central authorities or local authorities. At the end, a few small critical points that uh, I want to stress up. So cloud computing means different things, but there is one special point. One typical uh, classification is talking about uh, cloud computing, public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds, community cloud, uh, and things like that. For me, the important thing, the new revolution that is coming up is the availability of the so-called public clouds. The technology enables companies to, to adopt this kind of metaphor, the cloud computing internally, but I'm not interested in that. It's just technology. We are used to, to it happens every time. It's interesting to see what is happening. There are very large offerings. Google is one of them. There are a few others really important. There are many small, but that's not so important in what is happening. So I'm stressing public, public cloud, and I'm going to talk about public cloud, how because of this technology and the availability of those services can help us in the things we are talking about. So, what, is the, what are the two key points that public cloud can, uh, and cloud technology and public cloud can help? First, cloud technology gives a high automatic scalability. If you run something, you build something, it can almost automatically scale as soon as it is, uh, has success, as soon as there are many people trying to use it, which is important. It's not, you're not building a small application, then, then you cannot scale when you need to. Uh, 
The second point is, it's quite easy with public cloud offerings to deploy and it has low management costs. It means that, if you see here, the difference between the, uh, that's my, my personal opinion, eh? Web 1.0, the one that we know since uh, more than uh, 15 years, everybody in the world, has enabled consumers and citizens, which are, consumers are also citizens, to passively access information which are published by medium to large organizations. We know that. The static sites or complex and big applications being developed very co costly and so on by business, large business organizations, also governments and so on. Then Web 2.0, but what is really Web 2.0? Is the fact that it has enabled with some technology advances consumers and citizens to actively provide and exchange information, not only access but also provide, using initiatives started by the still medium to large organizations. The public cloud availability, the fact what is already a fact nowadays, enables consumers, citizens, small, large organizations, local governments, small authorities, large authorities, big governments, to start collaboration initiatives by themselves. So everybody can start something easily. The things that we are going to, to talk about could, obviously there are more complex and less complex, but could be started by the single citizen. If it has a good idea, eh? it will need funding for other things, but the, it can start things. Things can start from the bottom. And that's the, the title of this slide. It's a bottom-up process. So public cloud, the public cloud is democratic. Anyone willing to promote participation can do it easily. It's a fact. Using the providers that give uh, tools and services which are strong enough to do those kinds of things, the large ones. Smart IT companies can invent if they are able to invent something new, obviously, but then quickly build and offer new smart services in different areas. Some of those areas can be in areas of the e-participation. Small organizations, public and private, and even smart citizens can select and easily deploy and manage them. So uh, a company can have an idea, a small one, can build it, can deploy it itself, or it can sell to somebody else that at low cost can deploy it, et cetera, et cetera. Central governments, at uh, this point, uh, central authorities, uh, let's say the larger organizations, the public organizations, at this point, uh, should not try to do everything themselves with large projects, but should try to manage, govern, and they will be stimulated and prodded to offer similar services. At this point also the small local authorities and, and um, administrations. It's a kind of marketplace approach, not a top-down dirigism. This is a matter of fact, this is my opinion, and this is what's happening all around the world at this moment. Now, which smart services? We are used to talk about social networking and things like that. Facebook, etc. This is just one case. It's uh, the new things that are coming are the ability to not just to exchange informally, flat, uh, in, uh, unstructured information between people, but to do structured collaboration with having different roles for the different people. The things can be more solid and application level, more controlled. It's a richness of inter user interfaces are coming, not only the browser, but everything, in any case, internet-based, that's all. But you have uh, smartphones, uh, tablets, etc., etc., And uh, big use of geographical information for many purposes and so on. This is possible. That's uh, just the slides, uh, last slide, uh, some examples. There is one which is very, I would say, specific of what we are talking about. Uh, President uh, Barack Obama, during his campaign, uh, to collect ideas, to answer questions, 
has set up using a very simple and nice uh, service free of charge uh, from Google called Google Moderator, um, gave the ability to everybody to pose questions, to vote the questions, increasing the relevance and the importance of the question, and then Barack Obama started to answer the ones, the questions that were considered more interesting. It's something that is still being used, and it was not done with a large application built by the government or by himself with his money. It was a public service that any one of us could immediately start up to ask our friends where we should go uh, for dinner tonight, if it, uh, perhaps uh, there are better systems, and so on. And there are other possibilities, collecting opinions from citizens, having uh, citizens report problems, uh, also with geographical uh, things, and so on. Performing surveys with feedback for, um, to respondents, and so on. So, these are the, some examples that can be done. Many things, but starting from the bottom. I think that uh, there would be a last uh, slide of some critical points that we should uh, be aware of. Obviously, it's needed pervasive fast connectivity for doing accessing services on the cloud, and it's open the security and privacy concerns. The key point is that governments must rule out central authorities, watch and control, and sort out the existing uncertainty that is around this topic. When you speak with somebody, everybody says this can be done, this cannot be done, but there is not any clear uh, thing going around. I think it's... Uh, I'm done. Thank you. All right. I also need two hands to have a speech. Um, before, we, before we start, uh, did you ever f uh, think about it, why we are here, why we are discussing e-participation? There are a number of things that we have in mind, not always very conscious. Every one of us has a number of devices. We are always on, always online. There are, we have phones, we have tablets, we have iPads, we have computers, that's number one. Even when I'm looking at the, the, from the Polish perspective, when, when I'm looking at a country which is not the most, the richest one in, uh, in Europe, not most electronically advanced, the people in the age up to 35, 95 of percent of them, they are using computers at least once a week. So this is number one, we are online. When you are coming to the restaurant, your first question is not about, what the, well, can you bring me the menu? What is the Wi-Fi? Do you have Wi-Fi? What is the password to Wi-Fi? This is your first question. You want to be on. on. The second thing, look at yourself now. Uh, this is the kind what Ivar called fashionable, but it is the broader scale which is called consumerization. We are mixing the way how we are working and what we are doing in our personal free time. So right now here, you are looking at your emails and answering your emails, I don't know, private or professional, because it's mixed. You are doing the same when you are in a hotel, when you are waiting for the plane in the airport, uh, when you are at home, in the night, early in the morning, and you are mixing this stuff. The way how you work, the, work, the way how you live is different. That's why we are talking about e-participation, because these are the things that are also uh, going and have the impact on our life. And uh, let's think in the, in the way that we, which, uh, which is called new normals. The new normal is something in the state that we today we believe it's normal. A few years ago we didn't believe it's normal. E-participation is one of them. Let's think about the uh, digital divide, or in reverse, e-inclusion. What is the digital divide? This is not that people don't know how to use the uh, electronic gadgets. It's only the, the, the real problem is that the things that moved to the internet, they are vanishing from the real life. If you want to buy a car or a home, you have to be on the internet. If you are looking for the new job, you have to be on the internet. If you are not, this is your uh, exclusion from the normal life. 
This is the problem, not the problem is that I cannot go with, with ATM machine. Okay, Vincenzo uh, has stolen a part of my, uh, uh, of, my, uh, of my show, so yeah, <laughs> thanks. Oh, in fact, they, they're gonna listen for the second time, the same story. Um, the cloud is part of that. Yes, we are in the cloud. When you are in the social uh, networks, yes, you are in the cloud. When you are using your email, yes, you are in the cloud. So that's the part of our life, and it's cheap. It's, it's extremely cheap. Sometimes when I'm talking to the businesses, I'm asking who, who, draw, who has come with uh, his or her own Ferrari or Porsche or Bentley. And people are saying, no, 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 I'm driving my Ford, I'm driving my Opel. That's because the Porsche and Ferrari are uh, produced by engineers. Don't look at cost. But all the cars that we are using, thanks God, they are in fact created in the cost in mind. So that's exactly the same with the cloud. And one more slide that uh, also Vincenzo has on his slides, how we can think about cloud, what is the, what's the different type of cloud. So you can use the uh, infrastructure as a service. So cloud is a service. It's a service, it's a service, it's a service. It's around us. This is like the power in the plug in a wall. It's coming from somewhere, nobody knows, maybe from the Facebook center in northern Sweden. But in fact, I don't know. Where, is the, where are the Amazon servers? I don't know, I don't care. It's, it's all around me. So it could be the infrastructure where the data could be, uh, could be placed. It's the platform when there's some new solutions can be um, implemented or software. Many people are not in, uh, in interested in anything else than software. So if you think about the government and what government can do for, for people and what the type of the uh, service can be brought to, uh, to, the, to the people, think about that. Infrastructure as a service, think about the public information, think about the public data. This is the very, very important thing today that governments decided to have to publish their data. Basing on this data, many people can start building applications. Do you remember it was today? I think, Julia, it was you that mentioned about this time, uh, time sheet for the buses, okay? No, okay, that, would, that people just getting the information, just very raw information, they are starting to build services on top of that. Very often governments don't know what the type of the services it will be. The, the, the types could be very, very different. It could be the commercial service. It could be the watchdog. It could be the social service because we are going for the petitions. We need, we need to uh, go for some feedback. It could be the citizen type of service, fix my street. People who are just making photos of the whole in the street Placing the, combining that with the geographical data and sending to the government. Okay, fix my street, there is a hole in my street. So many, many things that could be made, uh, made up on, uh, on, cloud, uh, on cloud services. If you look here and, there, and you think about the government, look just on the last one point. So there is a need for the increased citizen interaction. Of course, there, is, there are other reasons why the government should leverage cloud, because of the cost constraints, because of the number of the uh, skilled people, IT administration, every government across the world has the same problem, that there is not enough people to go with the government IT. So just use it as a, as a service, not, not build from, from their own. But increase citizen interaction, Involvement into political process, maybe not on the level like Ivar was presenting, very high, let's talk about laws, let's talk about the acts, on the low level. Very often this is, we are not agreeing to something, we want to do something different way. That's the, that's the kind of the interaction that is happening very often. In Poland we have made a 
together with the Institute for the Market Economics Research, we have made a report on how to use cloud computing for the small and medium enterprises, something that we describe, discuss today quite often, for the education, for the e-justice system, for the e-health. These are only the this is only the beginning how to leverage the, this paradigm. And an example of that uh, type of the services was something that was made by European Environment Agency. Once again, public data. The data, the raw data that came from the different measurement points combined with the geographical data here from the Microsoft Bing and all together was showing what's going on with the weather across, across, uh, across Europe. Some application built on, on Windows Azure. So that's how it could work. Of course, you can choose your own technology. I'm from Microsoft, so I would always ask you and beg you and please to, um, okay, my time is end, uh, to use my technology, but you can use any technology, in fact. You can use any type of services because cloud is around you. And cloud is something that all the citizens, all the people will use uh, very, very often today here in this room, today during the banquet in, in, the, in the evening, and tomorrow during the, during the conference. Thank you very much. Yes, I was trying to make sure that we have enough time for discussion, so I will conclude keeping within 10 minutes, uh, and I wouldn't be myself if I didn't raise my own issue. As I mentioned at the beginning, I make my company's revenue on administrative back offices. And that has been 15 years, and I've provided back office administrative process support from the Prime Minister's Chancellery to small administration, municipal agencies, whatever. And I have some views on that, if I can get. But first of all, I'll try to conclude. The first question is, uh, is the business ready and willing, willing, I stress willing, to e-participate? We say maybe, after what we've learned from Christine, maybe that's okay, maybe e participation would work for business in some cases. And even though uh, we had reluctance from the legislative side of, of the government, we might get cases which would be successful. And that, what Eva was telling us, the hands-on experience tells us that this is possible, and obviously with some more culture of interaction, we can use and exploit this new paradigm of democracy, in fact. It's a different democracy. And we have positive examples. Technology is definitely ready. Technology is the easy part. You know, it is expensive. In some countries, it's more expensive. There's more hype. If you do go along with Prince, you spend three times as much money than if you go with other more agile methodologies. Nevertheless, this is not a major problem. So what is the major problem, in my view? is the eternal administrative back office issue. And that's what really exists. First of all, the question is, what is the proportion of routine work versus knowledge work? And if we want to have efficient and effective government, efficient would probably be routine. We want to have administrative processes that run smoothly, inexpensive, that are measurable, and that we could optimize. This is all routine. We need people inside, but it's all routine. Whereas if we want to have effective government, the one that passes out good planning decisions, that creates good law, that creates satisfaction of the society by good interaction,